and I decided to come up here and tell this. This is Al. I'm Mary. Her last name is Palmer. Story together, and we do a lot of things together, which will become evident in this. So the first part of this, I was going to tell. We were going to tell about our upbringing, which was not the same, and pro probably not as typical as. Go ahead. What you would expect. <laughs> So uh, I'll go first. Um, I grew up in uh, middle class America, you know, suburbs of Detroit and all that. And it, as you're growing up, you don't realize what's normal and what isn't because that's your life. And so I, you know, with hindsight, I found out that there was a lot of differences in the way I was raised in compared to a lot of people. And so to, to um, give you a little history of my family. My dad, uh, if you've ever watched Sanford and Son, that would be my dad, and uh, he was he was a, a, a collector, a pack rat, a hoarder. Uh, you know, he had everything he ever owned. He kept forever. And my mom, if I was to make a reference, was Martha Stewart. This and is true. Everything Ooh. was perfectly straight when she did work. It was. Right down, I mean, if it wasn't, she, she was a homemaker and, and a professional as well. At the same time, always had a garden, home can, did everything, Girl Scout leader, all of that stuff, uh, and did a perfectionist job at all of it. So that was a real dichotomy, growing up having those two um, lifestyles in my house and the garage was like one world, and the kitchen and the living room was a completely different world. And I didn't realize then that it was setting the ground for the, for the way Mary and I live, because we <laughs> Because, whoa, this is really loud. One of us is like Fred Sanford. I'm not Martha Stewart, but... Um, <clears throat> I'm trying not to collect as much stuff, but I do have a lot. So, growing up, uh, just to give you a... You know, my dad had a lot of mechanical aptitude. He did all the work on the cars. He was very gifted mechanically. He was an artist and he was a high school, uh, elementary school teacher, which was uh, great. Um, but my dad didn't really like kids. So how did he get to learn for 30 years? I have no clue. So I didn't spend a lot of time with my dad. And I was raised pretty much by my mom. And it wasn't broke home or anything. My dad was a good provider. He was a great guy. But I was a Girl Scout longer than I mean, literally, I went to the meetings, I, I, uh, I made sit-upons, I made makui sticks, I sang tango in the woods and ran around with all the girls and didn't know that wasn't what you were supposed to do. But I learned a lot. I mean, it was, a, it was an a educational time in my life. I, I, I have no complaints, uh, it's, but I do realize that probably not a lot of people were, were grown up in an environment. So I will just go on a little bit further. As I was going through school, I was, I was a mediocre student because I did very well in some of my classes and very poorly in others. And I didn't know why this was until I started taking education classes and started to, uh, actually I did a report on myself when I was in college. I went back to my high school and I pulled all my records to see what kind of a student I was and what my teacher's notes were and all that kind of stuff. And I pulled out my scholastic, scholastic aptitude tests. Scholastic aptitude tests and where they do the subject matter. And this was a real eye opener for me because I was just learning metacognition. How do you think, how do you, how do you understand the world? My mechanical reasoning skills were literally off the chart, 99 percentile. My reading and spelling comprehension was 17, which means 83 people out of 100 were better than me. And so I'm like, wow, that's why I flunked English and got an A in physics. You know, I mean, there was, it was, I was really focused in those areas and really had a hard time in others, which I found out later also isn't normal. But, you know, if you can find your niche, you can take that and run with it. So when I discovered my strengths, and even before that, I was directed into uh, vocational training and educational training and stuff like that. And, and I did well educationally in the courses, which were technical and mechanical. And I did poorly in a lot of the other. I actually flunked music appreciation, 
while I was a piano player at a bar. You know, I was like, how do you do that? You know, so <laughs> I know. Okay, so is all right. My, is it my turn? Yes, I'm done. Okay. So I, similar to Al, you know, we both had mom and dad who were good people. I had two older brothers. He had two older sisters. We're both the babies. Um, you didn't talk about your church background at all. Oh, yeah. Well, I I'll, I'll give you a minute, a second. So I was raised Lutheran. My mom and dad were highly involved in the church. Anytime the church was open, we were there. We were involved in everything, and that seemed very normal and familiar to me. Um, I was good in school. I always loved animals, loved music. Um, another hobby I had when I was in high school is my dad was a big hunter and fisherman, and my brothers were to some point too. So I think my dad was looking for something he could do with me because I had a good relationship with my mom, but my dad and I didn't really do anything together. So he said, here, here's a rifle. Let's go to a rifle team. There's one opening up in, in our area. So I said, okay. So every Saturday I went, my dad went along, helped with the range duties and stuff. And I had a girlfriend from high school who's, whose dad thought that was a neat thing too. So we went to a rifle team. We did the, um, the NRA, uh, can't think of what it's called. Uh, if you, it, it takes several years. You shoot targets in different positions with 22s. So we did that in an indoor range every Saturday for like three years. So if you, if you do well enough, not everybody gets to the end and gets the certification, but I got an NRA Distinguished Expert Marksman, which means I can shoot really well, which is kind of fun being a girl because if you bump into other people and say, oh, I shoot, they immediately assume you don't know which way to hold the rifle. You don't know how to load it. You're like, oh, I don't know. But then I'd beat their pants off. So that's kind of fun. So um, I went to college at the University of Toledo. My mom worked there as a secretary in the engineering department. So I got free tuition, which was a heck of a gift. So I was thinking about going into music. And my mom and dad were like, you're not going to be able to make a very good living at that. You should go into engineering. You're good in math. And I thought, well, okay, I like music better, but I can see that I want to be able to make money. So I went into engineering, and electronics engineering, and I was getting through that, but it was not easy for me. I worked really hard. I got B's, C once in a while, but I was, I was doing a good job getting through it. So I was almost through the program, and my mom said, hey, we're hiring this new instructor. He, he went to Ferris. I had a family connection in Reed City, which is close to Ferris. My uncle was a Lutheran minister up there. We'd go visit. My mom's like, oh, he's a private pilot too. So my dad was an A&P uh, airframe power plant uh, airplane mechanic. Both my brothers flew. So she's like, oh, here's, you know, here's a neat, neat guy that has some stuff in common with our family. So Al thinks that my mom was saying, hey, you should grab this guy, but that's not what was going on at all. Al thinks it was. So do you want to jump in? Well, you wanted me to back up a little bit. So okay. just uh, I, uh, I, I came to religion on the radio. And as some of you have known, I, I'm kind of a radio fanatic. I, um, one of my degrees is in broadcasting electronics, which is not the people in front of the microphone. It's the people behind the microphone. And I grew up fascinated with that even before I knew what it was. And I became, Mary talked about being Lutheran. We were not regular churchgoers, but I started listening to church on the radio. That was important to During me. During your paper route. During my paper route. I would deliver papers and listen to having my little transistor radio. Uh, and I would listen to um, uh, a church service that, I, that my uncle went to. And uh, I knew of the pastor. He, he was a pretty popular guy and because of the radio show and stuff. And I became interested in that. That, um, that became an interest of mine. And so I would be, I would ask my dad to take me to that church and he would take me there and drop me off and then come pick me up when it was over. So yeah, I'm like, really? He couldn't like get out of the car and yeah, go to church with you? Yeah. But so I, I would, won't say bad stuff about Elston. You know, he, so he and he and my uncle, we went to the annual Father's Day banquet. That was the only time they were ever in church together that I can remember. So uh, it, it was sporadic. And, and I really think I had a calling 
to church, but I wasn't encouraged early. So getting involved, like the interest I had with radio, when I went to college, I continued on radio, chief engineer at the college radio station and did a lot of maintenance and repair work there. So, you know, I, I enjoy that aspect of electronics. And so that was one, one of the things that brought me to church is as little as I was involved. But that was one of the things that, that you know, encouraged me to do that. Because Al doesn't sing, and he doesn't feel yeah. like he, he feels like, if I can speak for you, yeah. he feels like his way to worship God is by running sound and making sure that stuff works Service. good. Yeah. 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 So I enjoy, I enjoy what we've done here with speakers, microphones, mixer board, you know, the stuff that is um, not obvious to the casual observer. And if you do your job right, nobody turns around and looks at you. <laughs> Unless there's feedback yeah. or something. Then feedback, they're like, uh. I look out and I see all these faces pointing at me like, eh, sorry. Fix that. Yeah. yeah, so that, you know, that's my contribution. Uh -huh. And I enjoy it. It's not something I do, you know, begrudgingly at all. So do you want to jump ahead to when you went to University of Toledo? So, yeah, I, um, before University of Toledo, I was a bicycle mechanic, and uh, I, um, it was traveling. I did this in summers between college classes, and, and we went around to uh, five countries in Europe, and I was the traveling mechanic. So I did straighten wheels and derailers. And I think you tires. saw a little poster up on a signboard in college that said, travel Europe over the summer, join Bike Europe from Ann Arbor, and we're on a five-week tour or something like so that. So I called them up and I said, do you guys need a mechanic? And they went, uh, yeah. So I went there and I traveled the trip with them. And I was always a bike rider too. And so, uh, you know, I did the bike Belle Isle Bicycle Marathon, which is 200 miles in 24 hours. And I did that like four times. And, and I delivered my papers on the bike. I did a bike trip to Mackinac City when I, before I could drive. I mean, we rode from Detroit to Mackinac City and back when I was... With no eight. adults. With no <laughs> <laughs> We didn't worry about that then. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, uh, so I did that for three different summers. And one of the summers when I went to the University of Toledo after I met Mary, Mary <clears throat> went on that trip with us. Yeah, and, but you're getting ahead. You have to talk right. about our first date. All right, you tell me about it. Okay. So Al got hired at the University of Toledo. <clears throat> he was teaching night classes. I was almost through the program. I was working in the lab passing out equipment. It was a student job. So a bunch of us in the lab were going to go out to Tony Paco's. So if you've ever watched MASH, I know MASH is an old show, they always talked about Tony Paco's uh, restaurant in Toledo. So that they had a, a good band and stuff. So clingers thing. Yeah. So a group of people were going. So Al came up and said, "Hey, do you want to go to Tony Paco's?" And I said, "Sure," thinking he was offering me a ride. So I invited another guy along. So that that was our first date. Yeah. After we got there, I realized, oh, he was asking me out. <laughs> so that was awkward. And I could also tell that he was never going to ask me out again. Well, it was a, it was a bad day. I yeah. mean, well, Tony Paco's doesn't serve anything. That I didn't know at that point. If you know Al at all, he likes bland food, bland room temperature food. Nothing mildly spicy, no onions, no peppers, nothing. Potato chips. Yeah. yeah. So Tony Paco's is known for their hot chili. So he didn't know that. I didn't know that. So he went there and got a bowl of chili took a bite and, and I saw his eyebrows go up to about here. So the only drink that was on the table was a pitcher of beer. So also, if you know Al, he doesn't drink anything besides like diet pop. So it, <laughs> the night just <laughs> kept going down. <laughs> Had a half a glass of beer to wash down the chili yeah, that was terrible. too hot. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I figured out from that, he is never going to ask me out again. That was true. Yes. So you're not supposed to date your students anyway. I was not your student at that point. Well, so anyway, she was in the program, and that, I asked him out to a movie that, uh, the next week. Iffy situation. I asked him out to a movie the next week, and he was like, "Okay." So then, then we started dating and got along pretty well, and so got engaged about a year later. After Mary proposed to me, I proposed to him. <laughs> yes. So I should explain that a little bit. Um, Al's parents divorced when he was 18, and he seemed uh, he got came home from college, and they'd broken up housekeeping, and 
sold his stuff at a garage sale, yeah. I think. Yeah, I came yeah. home to the house was gone. Yeah, so that and divorce then, has a lasting effect on, you know, everybody it touches. So for him, that made him really gun-shy, and he was like... Kathy was divorced. Yeah, his sister point. was divorced. His other sister ended up getting divorced. So he was just like, all I can see is this is going to end badly. I don't really want to do that. So I was like, come on, let's get married. It'll be fine. He's like, okay. You know, I think <laughs> What's gonna, the worst that could happen? Yeah, it's going to be bad. But but we've just been married for 34 years so last month. In our, yeah, in our, in our you know, relationship, we have... <laughs> very, very um, defined um, sets of responsibilities. I should jump in here. When I met Al, he was like the uh, stereotypical absent-minded professor. You know what I'm talking about? Like somybody who's really smart in one area, but then they can't keep track of their keys, Everything. their glasses, their shoes. They're just walking around. Yeah. So you know, I thought it was kind of cute at first, and I didn't realize how how pervasive it was. It, it, yeah, with hindsight, you know, I could have done a lot more if, if I'd have had more support, which I didn't know I needed. I mean, I, you don't, you've never been exposed mm -hmm. to it. So, uh, you know, the first, when we went on Bike Europe, which I had already been on twice, I'd been around five countries in Europe, and I didn't see a lot because I spent a lot of time uh, fixing bikes and then when it was time to get on the road I'd, I was the last guy out of the camp and then the first guy into the next camp and then uh anyways when Mary went uh, if, if you can I realize should, sleeping should jump in a in here again. on your honeymoon for five weeks yeah I should cool. jump in here so we got married we had, got married in the Lutheran church had a small wedding had a pig roast reception at uh, Metro Park so everybody could change clothes and get casual before that which was a nice fit for us because we're casual outdoorsy people so <clears throat> Al had been on Bike Europe twice, so for you the third the time, yeah, the, the tour owner said, hey, if you want to bring your new wife, you don't have to pay anything, just pay your airfare. So we got married, we left the next day at a Detroit metro, Al took our bicycles apart. At that time, you could take your whole bicycle on the plane in a large flat box. You probably still can. Uh, probably, this was before 9-11, so I, now they won't even let you take more than three ounces of you shampoo. You have to pay for it. Yeah. So anyway. We did the Bike Europe trip. We flew out the day after our wedding, flew to London, and we stayed there for five days in a bed and breakfast. And then the trip started, so it was bicycle riding every day for five weeks. It's about 1,000 miles. Yeah. So we'd done some bicycle riding to prepare, but the first few days were pretty, yeah. pretty challenging because it was in England. It was hilly. There were no shoulders on the road, and we had to keep remembering to ride on the other side of the road. Because, yeah. you know, if you if you have to make a split second decision, you keep wanting to go to the right, and then people are honking That's right and into going. traffic. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it was a lot of fun, though. We went to England, Holland, Germany, Luxembourg. Luxembourg. England, Germany, Belgium, Holland. Belgium, forgot Belgium. The Luxembourg year before I went, I went to France too, but that the year we got married in 87, there was a bunch of terrorism. I don't older people, my age, older people remember there was like the Achille Loro uh, cruise ship that terrorists took over. There was just weird stuff going on in the world. 86 was Chernobyl. Yeah. So they, they took France off because of terrorism. But it was a it was a really neat trip. We rode anywhere from... 60 miles a day yeah, to about. like 30 miles a day. So we had to, we stayed in a tent, got up in the morning, ate breakfast, and then they gave us a map and we had to get to the next campground by that. Except we got to leave later because Al had to fix anybody's bike that broke so, so from the, the day before. The point I was trying to make is the third time I went on that trip, I saw so much more of all those countries because by the time I got the bikes ready for that day's ride, the tent was already packed up. Sleeping bags I did all the other stuff so that he could. That's when I started doing the domestics, and I couldn't get into the sag wagon until everybody was back on the road. So, so I think the point you're making is working together, doing different stuff. We got farther ahead. Yeah. Well, I got farther ahead. Yeah. And, well, we did too because we could leave earlier. So. Yeah, so we, I saw a lot more. Yeah. Spent a lot more time sightseeing and traveling, and even though people. it was the wettest 
Europe in a hundred years. It rained every day. Every day. Except when we were in England, it didn't rain at all. Every place else, lots of rain. So we kind of adapted that idea and the rest of our married life after we got back of dividing up the work and not working on stuff. So Mary's not allowed in the garage. And, and as I'm, far as he knows, and I'm I, not allowed if I need in, to borrow stuff, I borrow it and put it right back where it was. And I'm not home. allowed in the kitchen. Because he trashes the kitchen if he cooks. But I do like to cook bland food. But uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Mary's always standing behind me with a towel and a washcloth and wiping everything as I'm still you know, Well, you know, some people have the, uh, the process where they're cooking and they, they clean up a little bit as you go. And other people just go in and... Every dish is dirty, every flat surface is sticky, and That's there's junk cooking. everywhere. Yeah. I learned to make my famous chocolate chip cookies, if you ever had them, they're wonderful. <laughs> With only one quarter cup measure. That was the only thing. One quarter cup measure and one plastic bowl that someone gave him. This is when he was in the apartment. He didn't use spoons, forks, anything. He washed his hands it. really good, and he has gigantic hands. I don't know. Put your hand up there. I have good-sized hands. His are much, much bigger than mine. So he would throw all the ingredients with his quarter cup measure into the bowl, and then he'd take his monster clean <laughs> hand and go like this, no mix master needed. I didn't have a mix master. I did a lot of the things I do now by myself before I got married, and it was kind of surprising when we got married. Then we got a mix master, and I'm like, whoa. You, know, so who you can make cookies in this, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there was a... There was a Kind of a learning curve, but not really, because that's the style I grew up in. I never saw my dad in the kitchen. I never saw my mom in the garage. I mean, though, when you have a division of labor like that. And we have old-fashioned values. And uh, when we decided to get pregnant and have Holly, uh, Mary stayed home. I mean, we had that discussion. Mary... <clears throat> Mary did the child rearing because I, I was I was fine with doing that as long as Al supported us. I was happy with not having to put Holly in daycare, and I was fine staying home. And, and she was willing to live on a school teacher's salary with only single income, which was yes, not. Yes, but a lot. I'm I'm very thrifty and a good shopper, so we we made that work, and we can. So we, we had a leave still to live beaver beneath there. lifestyle. Yeah, beaver. except I didn't vacuum with pearls on. <laughs> so not to that extent. So that was. Not the style I grew up in, because my mom worked at, at my mom worked too university, um, Oakland University, and my dad was working. So there was a two working family. So um, you know, uh, I liked it better. And, and my mom always canned peaches, pears, applesauce, uh, all that stuff. And I started carrying on that tradition before I was married. It was tough when I was working, and I used to make my famous blackberry jam. And stuff like that. And then Mary was into candy, which was surprising to yeah, me. Yeah, my so. mom always worked full time, but she canned everything. My dad liked to go salmon fishing. I remember more than once him, them coming home Sunday night, and my mom would stay up late and pressure can the salmon before going to work the next day. So I knew how to do all that. So we just kind of so continued I eat, it. I eat pretty good. I mean, it's, it's good, high quality homemade food. Nice bland I, food. Yeah, yes, and I appreciate <laughs> that. So. Together as a team, but not necessarily arguing over where we have separate bank accounts, we have separate checking accounts, you know, all of separate credit rate, all of that. We haven't combined anything. Um, we live in the same house, but we do, we do do a lot of stuff separate, and I think it's easier to get along that way. We're not arguing over who has the checkbook and and what why is it? Yeah, know. what's this check for? Yeah. So so I want to jump in here. Um, Al has always had trouble remembering names, remembering faces. So his parents are like, you're just lazy. you got to work yeah, on this because he's a school teacher. So a lot of being a school teacher is it's nice to connect with your students and say, hi, Brenda, good to see you today. And Al would be like, hi. You know, <laughs> I, know that I, I know that's somebody I've I seen. But yeah, yeah. yeah. So and, and this is just one. I tell this story all the time. Al goes to Meyer by himself. He'll come home and say, some lady said hi to me in the store. I'm like, okay, what'd she look like? And he'll lean forward and say, like, this is very important information. She was about your height. She had brown hair and glasses. And then he waits expectantly, like I'm going to say, oh. I'm like, I have no idea who that was. Can you, can you give me anything else? And he's like, nope, 
she know who I she knew who I was. That happens a lot. It does happen a lot. Another time Al and Holly and I were at some museum on vacation and they had a surveillance system. So they had the, the cameras and then they had a monitor screen up so you could see people walking around in there. So Al says to Holly, hey, that lady on the, on the security camera looks kind of like your mom. Holly's like, that is my mom. Oops. So I was listening to this radio show and they were talking about something called prosopagnosia. So we, I did some work and it's it's a mental condition, you know, you're born with it, that the part of your brain that does face recognition doesn't work like it does in other people. And other people can recognize faces and, and I can't. And I took the twin study, like, are these two twins? And I'm like, no, yes. Yes, Wait, they're how? identical. Yeah, yeah. he, he so just... I, I, can't, I can't tell. He can't, he can't discern that stuff. He can't tell car models apart. He'll walk up to the wrong car in the parking lot. Is this our I've car? And like, no, yeah. it's not our car, and our car is a different color. <laughs> Still, no. Yeah. yeah. So, and he's not doing this on purpose. It's just weird because everybody else's brain, pretty much everybody else's, doesn't work that way. So he's made, had to make allowances to get around that. I recognize people <clears throat> by their voice and, yes. and context, which gets me in trouble here. Yeah, so he'll recognize everybody here if he's talked to you a, a few times, but... The voice is his clue. If he just sees your face, he's like. But there are many of you who I've seen at Walmart or Myers, and he won't recognize you. I don't know who you are, and I if don't. If you say something to him, then he'll be like, "Oh, that Sometimes. voice sounds familiar," and then then that can help him piece it together. But if we're standing together, this is my job. I lean over and say, oh, "That's Kelly Brain." <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, "Oh, yeah." Hi, Kelly. Then I know yeah. it's not like I Husband forget this. Dave, Nick, I, Mary, I don't, don't forget the story. Yeah. I just can't. Yeah, that's and just... he he knows who people are, but he can't put that together. With if you come up and talk to him, he's like, uh. So I've known this for a few years, and I've, and like most people that have shortcomings, <laughs> you learn to compensate. So I didn't, you know, see it as something yeah. If wrong, I'm but... next to him, I compensate for him. But if he's by himself, or he, if he was at work, so I recognize people by their hair. Or their clothes. Yeah, but that's a really bad way I to know, recognize I people. Know, I can't. So an example is if we watch a movie together, after the first scene, he'll be like, I can't follow this. I don't And I have to say, that guy had the dog in the first scene. Now he's got on a yellow shirt. And he's like, okay. So then that's annoying for the people around us. But then, you know, next scene, that's the guy with the dog. Now he's in a red car. Okay. So the worst case so, was we watched Bombshell, if you know that movie. It's like four blondes that got in trouble with Roger Hales or I don't know something. They didn't look at all alike. They I all had blonde hair. And he's just like, so okay, I'm like, I'm like, this is lady number one, them. lady number this two, no, yeah. lady number three. And Mary's like, okay, she's number three now. And I'm like, oh, okay, so she's the one. Yeah, that, you know. yeah. So, I mean, it's it's how you compensate. And so those are the things that you have to do when, you know, when you have shortcomings like that. And I, I coped, but probably, but I, when I knew I had these types of shortcomings, I just fumbled through. But when you know and it has a name and you know what the symptoms are, you can you can compensate better. So I never told anybody I worked with that I had these problems. And then later on, I finally said, you know what? If they know, they will help me or at least not be surprised when I go, I got nothing. Yeah, because so, a lot of people think, well, Al's a jerk. He didn't even say yeah. hi to me. Well, there's a reason for that. <laughs> he probably didn't recognize you. Yeah. I mean, so there's a lot of people here. One of somebody came. I don't even know who this was. Said, no, I can't. I'm Bunny's that. mother, and I'm like, I got nothing. And it was a rabbit that Holly, Mister Mr. Bun, Mister yes, Bun, that would mother. be Katie. Yeah. I don't know who Katie. Is. See, it's I. Katie and Aaron. Yeah. I'll okay. tell you later. But. <laughs> 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 so those are the types of things and especially if I see somebody from here at school then I'm like really lost and so you know so Al's had a lot to work around um, this this face blindness thing is hard in work environments the disorganization that's hard I just follow around after him and make sure he's got all his stuff before I push him out the door so Mary has allowed me to do a tremendous amount more than I would have been able to do just because my, my coping mechanism was everything was a system. If I had a system, then, then I knew The keys have to be on this hook. If the keys aren't the keys on this are right hook, here. we're dead. We have no idea where I, the keys are. If they're not there, I'm like, I'm lost. I got nothing because I don't know where else to look. That's the, that's the way I have to deal with things. And 
and I, I I bought a glasses box and I put all my glasses in there. So that it's I can, a tackle box, but it's like his plastic man purse, and he carries his glasses and keys in it and everything he needs in the, in this box. So my anyway, go bag. Yes, your go bag. Okay, <clears throat> so when after we got married, we went to my Lutheran church, but that which was which was fine. Um, then we bought our first house, and it was 45 minutes away. So we thought, uh, 45 minutes is a long way to drive to church. So we looked in our new community for a, a good church to go to. So first off, I wanted to try the Lutheran church because I, I, I was Lutheran. I, everything was fine. I like, I like knew all the hymns, knew the liturgy. Everything was familiar. So we went to the Lutheran church in our new town one time, and that day... The minister was giving a message, and he was using the example of the Messiah, the piece of work, the piece of music that you hear at Christmas time, except he called it Box Messiah instead of Handel's Messiah, and I was just like, uh, on, yeah. I can't go here. I'm a music teacher, <laughs> so we scrapped the Lutheran church, and we had nice next door neighbors at our new house, and they had actually built our house when their family was young. And then when their kids uh, graduated from high school, they sold it and they built a smaller house next door. So it was handy having them there if we had any issues. Like I'd be like, how is this hot water heater hooked up? He'd go next door and ask Skip, and Skip would come over and say, oh, I did this here. Great people. Great yes, people. very nice people. They were very, very persistent. They just bugged us incessantly. Come to our church. Come to our church. Come to you know, We need somebody to run sound. We need a substitute piano player. You should come to our church. Finally, we just went to their church to shut them up because they were very nice, but they just wouldn't leave us alone. So we went there. Um, Al got sucked into running sound. I started playing the piano, and it was uh, we met a bunch of nice people there. I came in with my background in sound and went, wow, these guys need help. And so I'm like, buy these microphones, put these speakers over there, hook this amp like this, run these wires, you know. And in the course of, you know, six months or a year, we had pretty good sound at that church. But my inability to deal with people got me in trouble because... Yeah, I should also mention, Al is a great guy. He's very compassionate, but he is very blunt. So sometimes he doesn't think, hey, if I say exactly this, will I tick somebody off? That that thought doesn't go through his head. He just tells them whatever he's thinking. The so sound came out great. I know, but <laughs> the other sound guy got mad and left the church, so that wasn't a... That wasn't a positive, but Al didn't do it on purpose. So we need to speed up. Yes, we need to speed up because everybody wants to get to lunch, and we've yeah. been talking forever. So blah, blah, blah. So um, we went to that church, which we met a lot of nice people there, but it was, a, it was a huge change from the Lutheran church because they were just starting to do praise music, no hymnals. There was the little uh, battle there between the praise band and the piano that goes on in every church when you're changing Types music of style. worship music, yeah. So, um, and it it was a Church of Christ, not a non-musical Church of Christ, but a fairly strict Baptisty Church of Christ, which I we didn't realize to start with. So we were welcome to work in our little areas, but I, as a woman, was only welcome to make food for the potluck, and I could do childcare also. So yeah, that was kind strict. of a that was a minus, because I'm a perfectly reasonable person I should be able to pass out the offering plates and speak from the pulpit or what whatever I need to do Read so but we stayed there until I should jump jump so, ahead uh, so we we had been praying a long time because I'd been switching jobs I worked at the University of Toledo for 10 years and then I just couldn't put up with the politics anymore so I left and I had a terrible job which I learned to like but I was like get me out of here yeah, he I took did. a job teaching high school. It was an hour away from our house. We couldn't find a house we could afford, so he drove an hour. High school started at 7.30 in the morning. He had to leave the, our house at 6.30. Al's not a morning person. All his college teaching career, he taught night classes. So this was a, this was a big, change. A big yeah. change. Plus, I remember him getting up every morning saying, I hate this job. Find me a different job. But I taught at other high schools after that where the drive wasn't so bad. And, and I learned to actually like teaching. Yeah, it was school. a long adjustment. And community college and regular <clears throat> college, he was used to people showing up who wanted to learn, who were paying to be there, were motivated. High school was like, this is stupid. I, I don't right. need this Spend class. Spend more time talking to counselors. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so just we had been praying to move and find we a new job. We had been praying specifically for, we want Al to be able to find a community college teaching job closer to our cottage, which is family cottage in Frankfurt. So we thought as long as we're praying and asking for stuff, we may as well be specific. So we prayed for several years. And uh, then yeah. this job up here opened up. I did some internet research. We weren't just sitting going, oh, I hope someone offers him a job. So Can I did. tell the story? It's 20 minutes. I'm hurrying. Okay. So um, I found this job on the internet at MCC. So we did the application. Um, he had, then then he's like, should we take that if we if they offer it to us? It's a it's a ways away. It was three and a half hours from our house. Our parents are parents are getting elderly. Holly was in fourth grade. There's a lot wrong, but we looked at that and. I don't know. We left for vacation. Mary says, throw your suit in the car just in case you hear yeah, from Yeah, we got to the end of the driveway with the car packed. I'm like, you know, I had a little nagging feeling like we should go back and get your interview suit and a good pair of shoes. So with the car, the dogs all in the car and us, we backed up to the house. I got out the suit and the shoes. Then sure. we went on vacation. At that point, our cell phones didn't work at the cottage, so we had to go into town to, like, the gas station and call up on a pay phone or a house answering machine to see if we had any messages and he had a message from MCC that said we'd like to interview you tomorrow we we're like whoo so 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 I came down from our cabin two and a half hours that way to Lakeview uh, changed into my suit from my shorts and went and did a job interview at Montcalm Community College and the interview went well I felt really good with it and then I locked my keys in my car so I was stuck down here and and I was up at the cottage with no car, and, and our like, other car keys, keys are down in Ohio. Yeah, you know, the usual key thing. So uh, some guy at McDonald's said, you need a ride? And I'm like, yeah. He drove me to some Chrysler dealer, and we showed him the VIN number. They made me a key. I mean, the events that took place on that interview just went like clockwork. And when we got home, we hemmed and hawed, and they called on the phone and said, you got to, you know, make up your mind. Sure enough, uh, you know, when we said yes, things fell into place. It and was we, like, we sat down and thought, how is this going to work? We can't. I had just too much had stuff. back surgery. I Mary, just had neck surgery. Mary had, had neck surgery. So neither of us could lift more than 10 pounds. We had to find a house in a month and move and, and pack up our whole house. And we had a lot of stuff. Our church family showed up and said, you're going. And they put everything in our house. That makes it sound like they wanted us to leave. <laughs> they, were so, they were very supportive. Yeah, they like loaded. 25 people showed up one day with boxes and tape. They packed up our whole house over several hours, put it in those pod trailers. We had the pod trailers driven up here. Then on this end, we still couldn't unload stuff. We each had the 10-pound you know, weight limit. To go. I was yeah. living in a hotel on... By Kmart, whatever that hotel used to be, the burn down. So we went, we found this house... And I, and I said to the guy, Mary likes this house. We want to buy this house. And I want to move in, but we haven't financed with the bank yet. And, he, and, and, he, and so he and the real estate agent went back in the back room. And I could hear do not let him move in. If he moves in, you're going to have to evict him because he'll be a, a, a renter. You can't let. And he comes out and he goes, you want to move in? You can move in. Put your pods right here in the driveway. I'm like, what? Okay. We moved everything there. We didn't. Even, we did this on a handshake, which was amazing to me that these doors were just opening. And then like the Al's new doors. boss said, "Oh, my church youth group will come out and unload all the boxes out of your trailers and we for were you." Still recovering from surgery, so yeah. So just throw them a ice cream sundae party later. And the kids came and unloaded the entire thing into our house, and it's like holy cow! We couldn't have not moved here if we wanted. I mean, this was kind of God telling us where we needed to go. We like really this. felt like it was God, because if we were just doing this by ourselves, I, there were so many roadblocks, yeah, and so, we just felt like we were on a conveyor belt and ended up here and got dumped in our house. And it worked out well, and I taught at MCC for 11 years until they closed the program, so um, I have no regret, regrets, and I <laughs> came here to, to end this story, I will say, I, I was wandering around looking at different churches. Yeah. And I thought this church was down on 91 by our house because I saw the sign. Oh, because that was the old church property. And yeah. That was close so to I go there house. and it's like, there's nothing here. You know, I thought that's where church so was. So then we so. looked on Google because we, we tried another church in town, which I won't mention, but 
the service was really nice, but nobody said hi to us. We even went up and said hi to people and said, hi, we're new. And they're like, yeah. Go sit down. Yeah, yeah, go over there. It's going to start like, in 10 oh, minutes. Oh, okay. So we looked on Google and found the hours for this church, and they were wrong. So it and said we, that I church. I think we were talking to Mark we, McQuillan's wife. We had an wife. argument. We were either talking to Mark uh, McQuillan's wife, I Lynn think. McQuillan, not Mark McQuillan, Pat McQuillan's wife. We were either what? talking to Lynn McQuillan or Jeannie Perry. Apart. He couldn't tell them apart. They don't really look alike. But anyway, so we That's got here you. like 15 minutes before the service ended because the time on Google was wrong. So whichever those two nice ladies said, oh, here, come on in, you know, introduced us to people, sat us down, pulled the stuff. So that was Pastor Dave was here. Yes. Yes. And I said, and do they need a sound system? <laughs> so I said, I know I can, I can work here. Yeah, maybe I can play in the praise band. So, so that's we thought, what's wow, great. We feel like this is a, a nice spot for us. So in conclusion, I want to say that God has been very influential in my life. He brought us here. He, he He's opened many doors that we don't have time to go into now. But um, I've been led and guided and taken care of uh, very well by the people around me and my church and my, uh, I, you know. My, Your lovely wife. And yeah. my employers and <laughs> Everybody has been very supportive and allowed me to do the things that I can do and I like to do. Because I feel like there's large areas that I can't do. And having this opportunity, being married to Mary and the occupation I came up with in this church, has been a great, great opportunity for us. And I have no... That's I'm all true. Very, very grateful. Any questions? I'm like, let's eat lunch. Yes, lunch time. Sorry we <laughs> took so long. Matt, we're done.